Okay, we start here, and we're in the land of the very small. I'm actually controlling this little guy around here. Um, this is basically cellular scale. We have like some fluid dynamics. Um, this basically is a very analog fluid version of Pac-Man. So basically, I'm trying to eat these little dots. Uh, these little bad things chase me. Um, certain ones, like these guys can kill me too. Ah, that's bad. Um, I have certain abilities in this world, but uh, this world is pretty much entirely procedural, procedurally generated. Now, the abilities I get from this guy, after I eat enough little of these food pellets, I get to lay an egg. So that little yellow thing is my egg. Um, I now actually get to go to the next generation of the guy. I can click on the egg and go into an editor. If we could bring the lights down just a little bit, if that's possible. Um, so here's a little editor. I have very simple parts that I can kind of build for this guy. I have mouthpieces that influence what I can eat. I can either eat filter food or I have a proboscis I can poke into things. Um, I have different movement methods, flagella, cilia, little jet, um, and weapons, like need assists, spikes, whatever. So I'm going to take a little spike here, put it on the front of the guy, um, and then go back into the game. And I've actually modified this guy's abilities now. So whereas those brown things used to kill him, now he can go in and attack him. Now, I still can't go after the brown guys, but um, now I have a new food source. Now, I can change my movement and get faster. I can get stronger. Um, so basically, the character that I'm controlling in here is something that I've designed in the editor. Um, now, over time, as I'm playing this game, uh, the camera kind of pulls out. The dip of the field, you know, kind of reses down. This guy grows as it gets more complex. Um, I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit in his life cycle. What you're actually doing is you're playing through several generations here. Um, and at every generation, you get the ability to go in and kind of modify it. So this is a bit later in the game. Um, we've actually gone now from a 2D to a 3D environment. Um, and now, rather than living in a little you know, drop of water, we're living kind of under the ocean. Now, this entire world you see here is procedurally generated. Um, and especially the guy which I've created as a player. And when I say procedural, I also kind of include player creating things, being very malleable in a procedural way. So for instance, um, the player creates his character, but the animations, behaviors, textures are all generated procedurally. Um, now this guy has a life cycle, uh, very much like the little cell guy did. He also competes with other creatures in the environment. Um, another thing to realize here that's kind of different is that all the creatures in this environment um, are coming from other players. Look around here a little bit. Just one over those guys. Now, when I say coming from other players, what I mean is that they are asynchronously being sent to your computer to fill out your world. We're actually building a balanced ecosystem. Depending on what your world needs, we deliver other players' content to fill out that world around you. Now, like the cell game, you know, this guy, when he reproduces, he lays an egg. Click on the egg. And now we go into the editor. Now, this is the editor for this guy. Um, you can see he's kind of made out of parts. Um, the editor here is roughly a mixture of kind of Mr. Potato Head, Erector Set, and Clay. Um, I can grab the parts and manipulate them. Um, I can even kind of like pull them off, um, morph them. So I'll pull that off. I can grab the uh, spine here, manipulate it. Uh, you see there's an underlying skeleton here, which gives me some clue as to kind of the internal structure of the guy. Um, and like Clay, I can roll the mouse wheel and actually sculpt him smoothly to give him his outer form. Now, these things are built out of functional parts that actually have meaning to the guy um, in terms of how he's going to behave and live in this world. Um, these parts also have are, are mutable. So let's pull off his tail here. The part categories um, come in functional divisions. So these are graspers. Um, a lot of the parts also have some functional value besides their primary one. So that's a grasper as well as having a little bit of a weapon ability. Um, but it's primarily grasper. Uh, this is a three-jointed leg. Make it a little bit smaller. Um, these are feet. So basically, I've taken my little swimmy guy. I can also scale the parts as I put them on. Um, so I've taken my little swimmy guy and basically pulled his fins off, which is going to mean he's not going to swim too well now. Um, put, let's see, another leg there. So this guy is going to be a tripod guy. 
Um, so the player can build like really unusual characters in here. The system will analyze what they built and then kind of bring it to life all procedurally. So um, we'll bring this guy back into the game. And because he lost his fins, he doesn't really swim too well now. So I'm going to actually have him kind of leave the ocean here. Now, the walking you see here is all procedurally generated based upon an analysis of the skeleton that you created. Um, and in fact, every verb in the game is as well. And once again, you know, the world you're seeing here is procedurally generated. Other creatures coming from other players. Um, like the other levels, this guy has to kind of survive. This guy's a carnivore, so I'm going to have him eat and have him come in and attack this guy. Now, the way he's fighting is based upon where I put his weapon, which is on his tail. So you can see, you know, the, it, I'm not close enough at one hit. Uh, so I basically have to chase. Luckily, I'm faster than this guy. Oh, there we go. Get off my head. Yeah. Okay. So we killed this little guy. Uh. Now we can actually start eating him. Now, one of the cool things about procedural verbs is that they can be cleanly mixed. Um, for instance, I can tell this guy to take a bite out of this guy and then tell him to walk at the same time and use that to actually invent a new verb, which is to drag. One of the real wins, though, is that whatever I've created in this game is going to behave differently. I mean, you know, it's just going to be fundamentally different behavior than anything that you might create in the game, uh, which is a huge win. And, oh, okay, he's a bad guy. <laughs> this is where you say, run away. Uh. Now, the game actually builds kind of a balanced uh, ecosystem, so you're not always the top of the food chain here. Um, uh, on the other hand, this guy's kind of fast, and, you know, maybe he has someone on his stealth, and maybe I can outrun these stupid little hoppy guys, and he'll go eat one of those guys instead. I think I might be safe. Yeah, okay. So one of the next things you do, basically you live out the lifespan of one of these creatures, um, and then you basically mate, which earns you uh, access to the editor, and you earn currency at this level of the game. So I can do a mating call. Try to find somebody to mate with. Okay, we'll see how that goes. And I'll kind of approach carefully. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Okay, and then we get to the procedural mating. Okay, enough of that silliness. Uh -huh. Then we lay an egg, and that gives us access to the editor, where we get to create the next generation of creature. Um, now, I want to give you a little bit of a sense for how open-ended this really is. Um, I'm going to load a few creatures that we've created in the editor, um, just to give you a sense for how creative the player can be with this. Um, this guy, I call him Buttface, but uh, you'll notice he has a rather non-standard leg configuration. But um, but still, he moves very smoothly. Um, very realistic, very lifelike. Um, you know, one little kind of subtle trick we're playing with here is that uh, you know, people have never seen butt face before, so they don't know how he's supposed to move, uh, as opposed to humans. Here's another one. Now, all the ones I'm showing you here are actually running the exact same script. Um, this, this guy has got kind of a large head. Uh, I call him Tweety Bird. It's kind of like an SUV or. This is the Ford Explorer, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I 
suspect he would have low fitness in the world. Uh, let's see, this guy called Hangdog, he's very cool. He kind of walks cool, too. But again, you know, basically the same code running on all these things that, you know, analyze what the player's done and then kind of animates them, brings them to life. There's also a whole procedural texturing step that we don't have to get into this. Like, you can't show you right now, but the ones in the world you saw that were procedurally textured. Um, this guy I call Dilemma. So the function of these guys is, a, you know, a combination of the parts that you choose for them and also kind of the topological... Uh, structure that you set up. So this guy just happens to have a very fast walking gait. Um, and it's a property of kind of the way the procedural animation deals with that skeleton. So a lot of the kind of performance of these guys is going to be emergent, you know, from the system. And of course, I insisted to the team that we had to do a Care Bear. So <laughs> but here's our Care Bear. I'm going to make him a really mean carnivore, you know. <laughs> now there's one more palette at the bottom here which is the brain palette. Now, this is what you're really trying to do here, is you're trying to save away a little bit of funds as you're playing the game and slowly invest them in the brain. This is kind of like your, sa your college savings account. You know, you, a lot of times you're buying stuff, oh, I'm getting beat up, I'm going to buy better weapons, or I'm going to hide or run faster. But if you can save a little bit extra, you start investing it in the brain and you work your way up kind of this ladder. Now, once you get the highest level brain, your creatures actually become sentient. And you move to the next phase. Now, at this level, um, the game actually mutates from kind of a first-person eater to an RTS. Um, now we're controlling a whole little herd of these guys. Um, now, one thing that... Uh, I talked about landmarks last time in my uh, talk last year, and I'm going to show you just a few of the landmarks for me in the design. One landmark is I've always been fascinated with the idea of monkeys with guns. And I don't know why, you know, but just what happens when you give monkeys guns, you know, it's just there's something cool about that. So... I'll, at this level, rather than, you know, the creature is now set. You've evolved the creature. Um, but at this level, I can buy them tools. Um, and I, in this case, I'm shopping for tools. And I'll talk about the shopping a little bit later. In this case, I'll buy them a spear rack. They get excited. We're seeing kind of more elaborate procedural verbs at this point. You know, they'll kind of have a response. <laughs> Decide what they want to do with it. Um, I'm going to try not <laughs> Now, before they get into trouble, I'm going to buy them a campfire here. Um, these guys are still a bit excitable. Uh, but I'm actually dealing with the social dynamics at this point. Um, depending on how they play them, they can become very emotional or very logical at this level of the game. Uh, let me buy them a drum. Now I bought them a drum, and now these guys have decided to start playing the drum. Um, and... Uh, this is actually a procedural dance, you know, based upon my creature. Yeah. So at this level of the game, you're playing it kind of like populist or something. I'm buying them tools. It's influencing what they can do. I can control groups of them now. I'll see them out on, like, hunting parties. And I'm, in fact, competing with other tribes. Um, at this level, the ladder that I'm climbing is I'm really upgrading their hut. Um, and so I'm going to buy them a better hut here, which will allow me to buy them better tools um, and also allow my, my tribe to grow. And I'm competing with other tribes for members. Uh, they have to do with food and stuff like that. Um, now, they're just basically living in this little corner of the world. I'm going to skip ahead a bit here. Um, if, as I upgrade the hut here, eventually I upgrade it uh, to the next level, which brings me um, to yet the next game, which is the city game. Now, at this level, we're basically playing a very, very simple version of SimCity. Um, I can, you know, decide what buildings to make them. I build roads. Uh, they have needs. Um, and basically, I'm trying to keep them happy in their little city. You know, and again, I have complete creative control over everything you see here. You know, so I am, you know, the player is the author of this little world. Now, like the tribal mode, um, we have a shopping thing here. Now, the shopping is populated, actually, again, with other players' content. Um, so if I don't feel like building something, you know, and I, just, I see something really cool that another player's made, it'll try to learn the style that I'm using and try to populate my shopping catalog with things in that style. Um, and then I can pick them here and then 
buy it. Um, or, you know, if I see something I want to modify or I want to build a, something from scratch, I can actually go into the building editor. Um, which, and we're trying to make, the, you know, all the editors in the game um, feel very, very similar. Uh, this is using similar kind of morph block stuff. You know, basically everything in here has like a handle. And I can kind of play around with it, shape it, you know, like these little... Um, we have categories, you know, from very platonic solids that have certain handles on them. Now, the building editor is a little bit closer to Legos, really. Um, I can grab an object and I can have it intersect or stack. Um, you know, we're trying to find the simplest possible operators. You know, the average person can very, you know, quickly learn, and this becomes a toy to them. You know, that they really have a lot of time. And we found this a lot in the Sims build mode, by the way. The players would go into that mode. There was a little bit of a learning curve, but they had kind of immediate, you know, feedback. And they got so, so much creative um, reward for doing that that uh, I've been looking at how we fold that experience more and more into the gameplay. Okay, so we basically added this little mushroom thing to our building. We'll go back in the game. There it is over here. So they're, they're happy. They like it. <laughs> the primary feedback for me in this game is kind of the, the happiness of my people, and they get only with like large-scale kind of social interactions between the characters. Um, as I mentioned before in the tribal game, you know, uh, this is my city, but I'm actually competing, you know, with other cities. Um, if I scroll across the map, I can look for neighbors. So here's another city. Now, this city was created uh, in the exact same editor, um, just using, you know, slightly different primitives, um, different texturing, you know, from the procedural texturing. But just as, to give you a sense of the variety of style that a player can do. So our city was kind of, I would call it maybe Dr. Seuss style. Um, this is more kind of techno-industrial Star Wars style. But these kind of demonstrate a little bit the kind of Pixar, uh, Pixar to Giger dimensions. Now, these guys also will have a very different culture than my guys, you know, depending on how they we evolved and how I, you know, dealt with them, or how the uh, computer dealt with these guys uh, during evolution and tribal. These guys are really kind of more aggressive, a little built more industrial. Um, at some point, once you upgrade your city enough, um, you get the ability to start building vehicles. This is how the cities actually interact. At the tribal, you're actually sending people from tribe to tribe and doing raids or, you know, trading. Having, you know, you can have kind of uh, good or bad relationships with the neighboring tribes. Um, at the city level, we basically have kind of three ways to capture or ally with another city. They're basically military, economic, or cultural, um, depending on kind of the, the cultural flavor of my people. Um, so they don't look very friendly, and they're heading our way. So. Uh, we can open our vehicle editor, which works very much like the building editor. There's a shopping alternative populated with, you know, items that other players have created. Um, and I'm just going to buy something here. Uh, like that, we have parts categories. These have functional meaning. So propellers, you know, can help the thing fly. Uh, certain things enable it to go into water or go on land. But um, I'm just going to go ahead and go for this goofy looking thing. This is kind of the, uh, more of a Nazca looking. And there they go. Go God knows where. They're a little goofy. Um, yeah, go to that city. Go, go, go. No, not that way. Oh. Okay, so they're peaceful cowards, so it's hopeless. I don't know. In the meantime, these guys are, uh, you know, not looking real friendly. So this, this is kind of militaristic, but uh, there are more peaceful avenues to kind of capturing cities. At this point in the game, we're actually kind of entering the... Uh, what I call the civilization game. Um, and this is a very simple version of a game like Civ or Risk. As we pull back now, for the first time, we can see the entire world, other cities. Now, one little trick you might notice here is that as I pull away from a city, it actually gets very exaggerated. Um, this is both for aesthetic and functional reasons. Like, as, as I pull into the city, notice how it pops to a realistic scale, but as I pull out, it actually becomes an icon. Um, that indicates actually the level of micromanagement. Um, at this level, the city is one big button and it has a very simple menu. If I want to go in and actually go in and still modify the cities, I'm still building Paris while they're attacking it, I can still zoom in and click the individual buildings and bring them into the editor and stuff. Um, so basically, you know, you play this game, the Civ, you know, game, you know, and slowly conquer the world, you know, city by city, continent by continent, until pretty much you have owned this entire little world and built it on the way. Now, I want this to feel like a very clock-like toy world. So you'll notice it, it actually is very exaggerated. Um, 
but in a kind of a stylistic way. Let me go back to our little city here, see how they're doing. We have a crater where that building used to be. Uh, in the vehicle editor, there's one more slot that over time we could eventually unlock as we're playing through the game. Um, you know, we started with ground vehicles, water, air, underwater. Um, and at this point, uh, I can now buy what we call the UFO. And I'm just going to buy a stock one. You know, I could have brought this in the vehicle editor as well. Um, now, this basically becomes your Swiss Army knife at this point. You know, this becomes the representation of all your kind of tools and abilities in the game. Um, this guy is very fast, very mobile. He can go anywhere on the planet um, in no time at all. Uh, now, there was another landmark that really um, kind of inspired me at this level. Uh, just a little short side story here. Um, there was this show I used to watch as a kid all the time. It was called The Mutual of Omaha's Wildlife Kingdom. How many of you saw that show? Oh, yeah. So it had Marlon Perkins and this other dude. I forgot his name. But uh, they would go around. Every episode was them saving some wild, endangered animal, you know, or, some, or studying it or something. But what I loved about the show was that every week, almost, the way that they chose to solve the problem, their environmental problem, almost always involved a high-powered tranquilizer gun in a helicopter. <laughs> and so I'd watch the whole show just for the scene at the end where the guy's in the helicopter hanging out, trying to get, you know, going through the herd, you know, nabbing the guy. Um, so that was something that I really wanted uh, with my UFO here. Um, and so the UFO really, one of the things it is, it's a content creation uh, tool. So um, I can go around looking for something. Um, let's see. Oh, these are the guys that were beating up us on us way back. Now it's time for us to get our revenge. OK. If I can get over to them. This is a little tricky. Whoa, whoa got him. Yes. <laughs> So here, this is basically a little abduction beam, um, and oh, that's too fast for me. Oh, I don't want to tank. No way. I can get that guy. Oh, man, they're, they're hard to get. Well, I guess one will do. Um, so I can use this to go around the world sucking up content. Um, and as you might have guessed, I can also um, use my UFO to kind of go further out, and further out, and further out, and further out, and further out. So here's the local solar system. Um, a few comets, there's our sun. Uh, we have hot planets near the sun. Uh, this is our home planet that we actually evolved on. Um, and then way out here, we have some cold planets. Um, we can click on any planet, kind of go over to it. And we can actually take our UFO there to investigate. Um, these planets really represent like little sandboxes for the player. So as we pull up to this moon, you notice geologically it's very different than where we came from, than our home planet. Um, I'm going to come down to the surface here really quick. Um, now, I'm going to try dropping that guy I just picked up. <laughs> um, can anybody tell me why that happened? If we can bring up the volume a little bit on this machine. Um, yeah, that's good. Um, so we had a little problem there. Uh, and we have no atmosphere. OK. So what we really want to do is we want to um, make this world livable. Now, at this level, another one of my kind of landmarks was an old thing called Kid Picks. How many of you played Kid Picks? Um, The, uh, I wanted this to feel like Kid Picks, basically. What I loved about Kid Picks is you had all these cool, weird, wacky, creative tools, and they were always out of your control. I mean, you always did these unexpected, oops, I didn't mean to do that type of thing. And I wanted the terraforming to kind of feel like that as well. Um, so I'll pick one of my terraforming tools. And these are things that you earn for the UFO. You're actually increasing your UFO's ability over time, and there are lots and lots of tools and different ladders. So um, I'll fire a little volcano tool. And so this is actually sculpting the surface of the planet directly. Um, and pumping atmosphere in there. Now over time, these will actually start developing a thicker and thicker atmosphere on the planet. But in the meantime, it can actually start building colonies here, um, even while I'm waiting for that. So. Spot, zoom in. Um, 
when I build a colony now at this point, I get kind of the style that I had on my home world. But it has a bubble over it. Um, this, by the way, is also what I would get if I were to build, at this point, a city underwater. Um, so at this point, this level of technology, I can start colonizing the oceans on my home planet. And they would have bubbles as well. Um, now, this kind of takes a while. Now, once I terraform the planet, I won't build a, need to build bubble cities. And I can actually build very elaborate kind of colonies um, that are earning me money to help me upgrade my UFO. That's kind of the, the real loop going on here. Um, we have a little cheat here. You know, this is at the very high levels of the game. Um, you will eventually be able to afford the uh, what we call the Genesis device. So this will very rapidly, if you notice the ground texture, you see things are starting to green up a bit. We're getting a little bit of atmosphere. Um, as the storm clouds pull back a bit. Um, so we are actually trying to bootstrap up the atmosphere, and then there's the biosphere score. So you, once you get a little bit of the atmosphere, you start then bringing in plants, probably that you've you know, harvested from your home planet. Um, and then you can actually start living there. So it's like a kind of a three-way colonization game, terraforming game. But really, we want players to be extremely creative kind of with what they build here. Um, so let's pull away from this guy. So now it's kind of green. That's a happy little place. Now we guys there. Um, so everything's good. Um, as I mentioned, the UFO has a lot of different uh, levels that you know you can advance on the different tools that you add. Um, one of the more expensive things that you really have to kind of work in here for a while and build some usable colonies, earn a lot of money. But eventually, you earn the uh, interstellar drive. And so we pull out again. Now this is our home planet here. Um, we call we call this the Stellar Zoo. In fact, we want to have all the real things that you would see in space. One thing that's always really annoyed me about the way astronomy is presented is it's presented as two-dimensional. If you look at star maps like that, I mean that's the way astronomy is taught. But it's yet it's this beautifully three-dimensional thing, and you just are not given the sense of what that's like. Um, we have these beautiful images from Hubble, and we're never given any context for how big they are, where they live, how frequent we see them in space. And I really wanted, to, uh, at this level, give a player a real sense of what it feels like to be out in the galaxy. Um, so we have things like black holes back here. Uh, we have planetary nebula. And this is basically uh, an old uh, supernova shell. Um, these very bright stars are like blue giants. And in fact, they're going to go supernova fairly soon. So I have to kind of stay away from those. So there's actually a terrain here to this. This is the Missum nebula, nebula back here, where new stars are formed. Um, but also, at this level, we uh, have a, a SETI tool. I can roll the mouse over different planets and listen to them. If I, I'm listening for radio chatter. I'm actually trying to discover other intelligence. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah, it's in an alien language, but I now know that there are aliens living there. So um, we can go visit that star now. So this is a different system that we're in. Um, looks like they had a little accident or something here. Uh, um, this is another race. Now, this is the point at which I am overtly browsing other players' worlds, OK? So this entire world was created by another player. And now the computer, you know, it's downloaded to my machine. And I want to emphasize this is asynchronous. Um, it's not a you know, simultaneous multiplayer game. I download it from the other player, um, and the computer takes over control based upon the personality sliders that the other players kind of set for it when they evolved it. Um, so let's go visit these guys. This is kind of a little hot planet because it's so close to the sun. You can see it has kind of a very different geology. Um, very arid. Very large sun there. So we have a big city over here. We'll kind of approach slowly. Now, when we're doing uh, first contact, with the other species, um, you have to kind of play this little close encounters musical game with them to try and establish a language. Um, and they may or may not respond well, depending on how you play it. So I'll try that now. <laughs> OK. But luckily, we have defensive tools as well.
So this is Space Invaders. Uh, my weapons are seeming a little ineffectual against them. Uh, but as I mentioned, you know, all of our, you know, tools in the UFO come in many different flavors. Um, so... So there go our friends, and there goes my reputation as a nonviolent game developer. <laughs> um, but we made a new ring. It was a nice crafts project. <laughs> you know. Um, so I'll just pull out to here. We're going to leave this place. There's nothing more to see here. <laughs> Move away now. Um, okay. So at this level, the space level, we actually want to build a set of metagames around, you know, basically my favorite genres of science fiction. Each one of these is going to be a metagame at this level. Um, you know, starting with something like War of the Worlds, um, kind of an adult supervision, peacemaker, Day of the Earth stood still type scenarios. Um, Uplift, where I go to worlds that have just primitive creatures. I can drop down a monolith, bring, you know, and basically come back later and see how they've evolved to intelligence to see those worlds. Um, first contact, uh, Abduction and crossbreeding, of course. You know, you'll have free access to the, uh, to all, you know, most of the editors at that point. You know, so at this point, I can go back into the uh, creature editor for free and make weird alien, you know, hybrids. Um, and diplomacy. Uh, every race is going to have its own kind of personality. Um, we're actually using the Star Trek races as kind of landmarks, making sure that we get, you know, with the smallest number of dimensions, we can clearly distinguish between all these races so that when I go up and interact, like the Klingons versus the Borg, or my versions of these things, that they should behave appropriately with each other. They, you know, they might want to fight or trade or just be good friends and share, you know, cool ideas, whatever. Um, we want the space game to really feel very, very open-ended, and this is where I think most of the narrative is going to come into the game. Um, I want the players to feel like they're creating these worlds. If you look at some of the old comic book covers from the 30s and 40s, um, that's what I want the players to feel like they can make these worlds, worlds of this variety. Um, and if you look at these covers, they mostly, you know, they have vehicles, buildings, aliens, and planets. I mean, so all the different things that we have editors for are represented on these covers. Um, this is some of the concept art we did for trying to get a sense of how broad we think players can build worlds um, aesthetically. Now, the pollination at this level is that we're actually doing overt browsing. You know, I'm actually going to another player's entire planet. Um, when I'm on the planet, I can actually, you know, abduct their creatures, steal vehicles, and they enter my library. I can use their creatures to go back and populate, like, an entire zoo planet if I choose to. Um, so, really, we have these different levels of gameplay. Um, and the overall structure of the game now is that of a T, um, that we're going up through evolution through all these different levels, and then we have these very broad set of metagames above it at the space level. Um, and this is actually a little bit opposite than most games, because what we're doing here is we're putting the more goal-oriented gaming first as the tutorial for the, the eventual sandbox, um, which will then surf down through all these levels. In most games, you think about it, the sandbox is kind of the tutorial. That's where you learn to play the game, and then you go play the real goal-oriented game. We're using the goal-oriented game to basically train you to use all the editors and to teach you the simulation dynamics at every level so that by the time you get to the space game, you can kind of fractally surf, you know, both horizontally, you know, from planet to planet, and vertically, you know, from like city to civ to tribal. So eventually, um, you know, the, with the players creating all these different worlds here, you know, pull out a little bit more. Now, the region we are in was like this little square here. Um, you know, I think we can actually create a whole galaxy here of, you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of worlds that the player can visit and interact with and kind of make up their own game along the way. Um, this was, you know, you might kind of notice this was an idea I've had a long time ago was Powers of Ten. I've always been a big fan of the Ameses. Um, but I never in my mind could figure out a way to kind of roll this into a game and actually make it all add up. Um, more recently, I started working on a SETI game because um, I was very fascinated with the SETI and astrobiology programs. One thing I noticed at some point, though, was that the interesting terms of Drake's equation, and this is the equation about, you know, a galaxy has this many stars and this percentage of them have planets and this percentage of them have life. Um, 
the terms in that equation map very neatly to the different powers of scale. Um, and so at some point I rolled the two up, the city game and the powers of 10 thing. Um, this is actually one of the first design doc, which uh, <laughs> Wired about a year ago asked me to do a page for them. They said, we're doing an issue on life, and can, will you lay out a page for us? And I said, sure, can I do whatever I want? And they said, yeah, and I just sent them this. I didn't tell them what it was. Um, and they published it last year, so the design docs have been out in Wired for a year now. Um, <laughs> Um, so it's a very simple player story here, um, and we needed a way to kind of, you know, compress this whole idea so that people can comprehend it, is that the player is going from bacteria to a galactic god. Um, <laughs> and that we're kind of basically trying to, you know, replay, you know, the complete history and future of life. Um, which, it's, it's hard to come up with a really kind of catchy marketing line for that. If anybody comes up with one, let me know, please. Um, now, the, the hub that all of this revolves around, um, and I haven't had much time today to go into the details, but the hub that really revolves around is compression, as I mentioned. Um, the compression gives us tremendous leverage for the player um, to make them creative, which is a huge win for the player. Um, it also, that same leverage, gives us generative systems, um, which we can use to populate huge content libraries. Um, also, it makes the uh, content very portable, that we can use to build an unbounded world around the player, which, is, again, is a huge win. Um, we did over 200 prototypes of this. In fact, I've shown many of the prototypes for this over the years. I just didn't tell you what they were. But um, prototyping has become kind of a religion for us around this. Um, and one last thing I wanted to say here. Uh, as we're working on this game, you know, a lot of the games I've worked on, I've always hit obstacles, usually trying to, you know, to convince other people it's a good idea or be sellable or whatever. Um, when I look back on this idea, you know, the biggest obstacle I truly had was making myself believe that we could build the game. It was my own imagination was the biggest bottleneck. Um, once I truly believed that this game was buildable, it proved to be actually quite easy to con, the, I mean, to persuade the rest of the, uh, <laughs> of my staff and the executives and everything that we could do it. Um, so I'd encourage all of you, if you've got like some totally weird idea that is just so far outside the box that you think, you know, there's no way that would work, go back occasionally and revisit those ideas because, you know, you just never know, you know, where they might lead to. And the uh, last thing is I can't talk about this again until E3. I'm sorry. I got special permission to talk about this today here. Um, but I can't say a word of it outside this hall um, after this until E3. But uh, that's it. Thank you very much.